Hello everybody. Uh, I'm going to apologize in advance. This video is going to be a little bit longer than most. Uh, that's just because of the way the semesters ended up. I uh, have to couple, cover a couple of things all at once in here. So let's talk about the Middle Ages. I'm going to talk about Christianity and I'm going to talk about um, the Byzantine Empire as well. So let's get started here. Christianity is our first topic. And Christianity, it really defines the way the Middle Ages go, but as you saw in the Roman lesson from last week, it, it starts a long time before the Middle Ages. Now, I'm going to approach this kind of from the neutral historical way to look at it. So um, don't be, please don't be offended if something doesn't match what you personally believe. Remember, this is a history class, not a, not a religious class. So, according to tradition, Jesus of Nazareth is born sometime around 3 BC, and uh, the teachings of Jesus follow traditional Jewish law, traditional Jewish custom, and traditional Jewish uh, traditions. There is one exception, though. Um, instead of teaching in the name of Yahweh, uh, Jesus is going to teach in his own name. And, believe it or not, uh, Jesus of Nazareth is going to disappoint a lot of Jewish people. Uh, at the time, the Jews were under Roman control, and there were several uprisings and rebellions that happened, and the Jews thought that their Messiah would be a military leader who was going to raise a physical army and overthrow Roman rule. Instead, what they get is a Messiah who is going to be about peace, love, and the kingdom of heaven. In fact, Jesus is attributed to a saying that says, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, meaning I'm not here to, to take care of the physical world. I'm here for the, the spiritual world. Now, the main focus of his teachings is going to be love and the avoidance of violence. And he's going to teach that traditional Jewish law should still be followed. Now, the reactions are very mixed. Uh, you have Pharisees who were strict observers of the Torah. Uh, they have a problem because Jesus is going to teach in his own name and not the name of Yahweh. Uh, the Sadducees are people who combined Jewish and Roman culture and created something new. They have a problem because they don't believe in the spirit world and they don't believe in the resurrection of the dead. They only believed in the Jewish law. Then you have zealots. These are the violent revolutionaries, and they have a problem with Jesus because he's teaching peace and love. When you put all three of these three, all three of these groups together, there was this real chance that a rebellion could break out around Jesus of Nazareth. So Pontius Pilate, or Pontius Pilate, however you want to say it, he was the governor of Judea at the time. Um, he has no problem with Jesus naming himself the King of the Jews. He has a problem with all the groups of people who dislike Jesus of Nazareth. And because he thought a rebellion was in the process of, of beginning, Pontius said the easiest way to stop the rebellion was to get rid of the problem, which was to get rid of Jesus. Now, interesting, um, Pontius, we had doubts whether he was real, but in the past, I think, five years, his likeness has actually been discovered in Jerusalem on a... Um, in a carving. So we know that Pontius was a real person. Now, the beginnings of the religion. Uh, believe it or not, Jesus did not start a new religion. He lived as a Jew and he died as a Jew, historically speaking, of course. Uh, Christianity has actually begun, historically speaking, with Peter's first sermon following the death of Jesus. That's where Peter preaches that Jesus has died and has been resurrected and has gone to live with Yahweh. And baptism becomes the mark of those who ex have accepted the resurrection of Jesus. Now, the followers of Jesus and the followers of Peter are going to spread this new rev uh, religion throughout Asia, and they're going to actively seek converts to Christianity. Now, the reason that Christianity expands is the Apostle Paul. Paul of Tarsus is going to change Christianity from this small sect of of Judaism into a true separate religion. Now, why Paul? Uh, he grew up in in the Greek world. Uh, he was familiar with both Greek and Latin culture as well as Jewish culture, and Paul was able to speak very easily and very f fluently to both 
large crowds and small crowds. Now there were several questions that had to be answered. Uh, one is, do you have to be a Jew before you can be a Christian? Another question is, do you have to accept both Judaism and Christianity? And then a third question, um, are Christians still subject to the laws of Moses? The laws that are found in the Old Testament. Now, Paul solved this by saying Jesus was the Son of God, and Jesus gave a new set of laws for the people to follow, and that the teachings of Jesus were open to everybody. Once that was clarified, the Christianity became very appealing. Uh, Christianity embraced men and women equally. It embraced slaves and nobles equally. It was all-inclusive. It was all-welcoming. It gave the people a sense of belonging and it gave people something to look forward to. Now, early Christians were persecuted until Constantine made Christianity cool. At one point in time, and this always cracks people up when we're in the classroom, Romans originally thought Christians were cannibals. Now, I, I don't know how many of you attend a Christian church, and if you do attend a Christian church, I don't know how many of you actually do communion. Uh, I, as a Lutheran, do communion. And you eat the flesh of Christ and you drink the blood of Christ. That is bread and wine or grape juice. But early Romans thought you were actually eating people and drinking blood. Now we have the Byzantine Empire we have to talk about too. This is going to be what Constantine starts after he beats Maxentius at the Milvian Bridge. Uh, it's also known as the Eastern Roman Empire. Uh, Constantine and Maxentius, they fight the Milvian Bridge, the Roman Empire split into two. The official separation happens in 395 AD. Now the Western Roman Empire ends in 476 when a quote barbarian named Flavius Odysseus is going to overthrow the last Roman Emperor and declare himself king. The Eastern Roman Empire is going to continue, though, but it's going to look different. It's going to be Hellenistic, meaning it's going to be based on a Greek culture. It also has more people than the Western Roman Empire, more urban cities, and it's wealthier. Byzantium, which will eventually become Constantinople, is made the capital city, and it's renamed Constantinople by the son of Constantine in honor of his dad. Now, Byzantium or Constantinople, whichever one you want to call it, it ends up with a Roman-style Senate. It uses Roman-style laws, and it has Roman-style magistrates. It really is a recreation of the Roman Empire at first. There aren't very many Byzantine empires I'm going to make you know, but there's two of them. Theodosius II, he creates the Byzantine Empire. And he's going to go back to Rome, he's going to find all the Roman laws, put them into one place, and start to or organize and arrange them. He's going to give these Roman laws to all the Germanic kingdoms, or the, quote, barbarian kingdoms, which helps keep peace amongst all the people, and it gives these Germanic kingdoms some laws and some regulations to follow. The other guy you have to know is Justinian. Uh, he was known as the emperor that never sleeps because it looked like he was always doing so much. He and his wife Theodora are going to put together the Justinian Code, which is based on the works of Theodosius, but Justinian is going to finish putting all the laws together, formulate them into a new code of laws, and then publish that code of laws for all the people. And the Justinian Code is in three parts. There's the code, which is the actual laws. There's the digest, which is a compilation of writings by all the judges saying, hey, this is what the law means, this is how it works. And then the institutes, which was a textbook for law students, or if you want to give it a modern equivalent, for like 12th graders. Uh, Theodora, who is his wife, of course, is also going to give women some rights and try to uh, bring the plight of women to the forefront. Now, Christianity, you got the Hagia Sophia. That's a picture of it. It was built in 537 BC. It was the largest and most elaborate church in all of Christianity. 
Uh, later on, it's taken over by Islamic forces and it's turned into a mosque. It does still stand today in the city of Istanbul. It is today a museum that you could go and visit if you ever go to Turkey. Uh, you also have the first great schism that happens in 1054, and that's going to create the Orthodox Church and the Catholic Church. Originally, up until 1054, it was just the Christian Church. Um, basically, what happens is there's a there's an argument over what type of bread to use. Should flat bread be used or bread with uh, with yeast? Uh, who has power? Originally, all of the the bishops of Christian world were equal but somehow the pope in rome became more important than the pope in constantinople or the the bishop of rome became more important than the bishop of constantinople and then there were sources of the holy spirit who actually proclaims the holy spirit is it the pope is it the the church itself is it the the christian bible so these are all questions that were raised in 1054 both the leader of the orthodox church and the catholic church ex community each other from Christianity, meaning they kicked each other out from Christianity, and it starts a, a fight that in some ways is still going on today. Now the big question is, is the Byzantine Empire something new, or is it the continuation of Rome? Arguments for it being a continuation of Rome, they're still using Roman laws, it's still based on the Roman government, and it was originally part of the Roman Empire. The argument for it being something new, though, is they're using Greek and not Latin, they're uh, not the Roman Empire. There's something different. There's something new. And they're actually seen as other by everybody because they're not really Europeans. They're not really Asians. They're kind of just there in the middle. And this is an argument that historians still have today. Is this the Roman Empire? Is it something new? How should we classify them? All right, the Middle Ages... Before I do the Middle Ages, here's your secret word of the day. Your secret word for today is mask, M-A-S-K. Mask, M-A-S-K. That is your secret word. All right, Middle Ages. Um, Western Europe and the Middle Ages. Um, the early Middle Ages, middle the high Middle Ages, and the late Middle Ages is how we kind of classify it. But when you look at the Middle Ages as a whole, 500 A.D. to 1500 A.D., it's about a thousand year period. And this is a time period where Roman power breaks down, Christianity is going to strengthen, and this new society is going to form that's based off of the old Roman ideals, uh, Christianity, and the new Germanic societies. Well, what is Germanic society? Well, it's not an ethnic group, first of all. It's a cultural group. These are not people who are all descended from the same same person or anything like that. It's a loose confederation. It's a loose group of people who kind of have similar ideas. Uh, there's three noble classes, or three social classes, I should say. There's the nobility, there's freemen, and there's serfs. Serfs are a little hard to understand. Um, they're not free, but they're also not slave. Basically, they're tied to the land. They live on land. They cannot leave that land. The land can be sold, but they as people cannot be sold. There are these warriors, uh, and then Germanic people are typically great eaters, drinkers, gamblers, and they gain prestige through war. Uh, if you've ever seen knights um, or anything like with knights, that's kind of where this idea comes from. Now, Christianity in the Middle Ages is broken down into three parts. You have the people who were supposed to be the believers. You have the priests who are supposed to be the servers. And then you have the bishops who are supposed to be the teachers. And there were five bishops. There was the Bishop of Jerusalem, Antioch, Alexandria, Constantinople, and Rome. All five of these bishops are supposed to be equal, but as I mentioned a few minutes ago, not Tuesday, that's, that's how I did it last semester, uh, the Bishop of Rome becomes the first among equals. The Bishop of Rome, who is supposed to be equal, becomes more equal than others. There's also this idea of monks and monasteries. A monk is a Christian priest who has no other business, no other family other than the church. 
uh, they would go around and they would preach to people. They would collect books. They would copy books. And they would be the ones who um, spread Christianity. And Christianity is going to become kind of like a government, but it's not really a government because it's a religion. But it's really, it's going to be this glue that holds all of Europe together since there's no one big government to take care of everybody. Now, you can't talk about the Middle Ages without talking about Charlemagne. Uh, Charlemagne was known as the King of the Franks. Now, what makes him important is he's going to put together the first large-scale kingdom in Europe after the Roman Empire. And his empire, at its largest, goes all the way from modern-day France to modern-day Poland. Uh, Charlemagne, he's kind of a cool guy. He's well-rounded. He would be the original Renaissance man, if you will. He was a warrior. He was a politician. He was a friend of religion. He was a fan of education. Uh, he believed in these personal relationships, and he would travel throughout his kingdom to go and meet people, and he would say, Hey, Tom, what can I help you with? What do you need from me? Um, I'll give you this. Just give me your support. Blah, blah, blah. Excuse me. By the time we get to the year 800, uh, Charlemagne has done so much for Christianity that the Pope is going to crown him the Holy Roman Emperor. Now this is pretty ironic because Charlemagne is actually a Frank, meaning he was going he was a, a Frenchman. Uh, he was not holy. He got power through fighting. He was not Roman, and he was not an emperor. In fact, Charlemagne himself never referred to himself as the Holy Roman Emperor. He called himself the King of the Franks. Now, he does have a little miniature renaissance called the Carolingian Renaissance. Uh, he's going to reform the church. He's going to create a new version of the Bible, and he's going to start liberal arts. The other thing you cannot get away with missing when it comes to the Middle Ages is feudalism. Uh, briefly talked about feudalism when I talked about China a couple weeks ago. The idea is very similar. Uh, the Lord is going to give land to a vassal. The vassal agrees to give the Lord money and protection. And then the king is the top lord. Now, you can be both a lord and a vassal at the same time. The king may give money or land to a, a vassal. That vassal can give land to somebody else. So that vassal becomes a lord to whoever's below him, but is still a vassal to the king above him. The land controlled by the vassal becomes known as a manor. Now the serfs or the peasants, they work on the land of the lord. That's where the, the word landlord comes from, actually. And they can be used as soldiers. The serfs have to pay taxes to the lord as well. But they're not free. But they're not slaves. I like to say it's like dirt in the field. Uh, you can't just pick up all the dirt and move the dirt away. The dirt comes with the field. All right, the High Middle Ages, that's just 1000 to 1300 AD. Um, cities are created then, and the reason cities are created is because people want to make their own rules and be in charge of their own affairs. Uh, by becoming an incorporated city, they can do business directly with the king instead of having to deal with the local lords. Now, to become an incorporated city, you have to pay the local lord money, and you have to pay the king for the right to do business with the king. There's a lot of money involved with being incorporated. Now, you might be asking, why do they spend all this money? It's so they can make their own rules, their own laws, they can set up their own guilds. And these guilds, by the way, still exist today. That This is going to be a question on the final, I can tell you right now. There are three levels to a guild, and if you know anybody who's an electrician or a carpenter or anything like this, it's still true today. You have an apprentice who is learning how to do everything. You have a journeyman who is kind of like the second level. They've learned enough to work on their own, but they cannot open up their own shop. And then you have the master who is the best at doing it. A master can train an apprentice. So that's the order that these guilds go in. An apprentice a journeyman, and a master. And that's how business was done in the Middle Ages, and that's how business is done a lot of times today, too. Now, there's a lot of struggle between the church and the state. By 1,000, the church is really powerful. It, once again, it's the glue that holds everything together. But the lords and the kings are very powerful as well. 
So there's this question about who really is the one that holds the power. The Lord gives land to the church, and then the Lord wants control of what the church does. The church is going to say, you gave us the land, and we answer to a higher power, because we're a religious establishment. So there's this real question of who is the one in charge. Now, why do lords give, give land to the church? Well, one big reason is money. The Christian church is supposed to take care of the poor and take care of the weak. And if the church is taking care of the poor and taking care of the weak, that means the Lord doesn't have to spend that money. Another reason is prestige. Look at me, I'm a Lord. I'm so rich and powerful that I could give this money to this church and have this church built. And tourism. A lot of people from far away would come to these churches and come visit and see if they had any relics or, or religious figurines. Eventually, there's going to be this investiture controversy where this argument between church and state comes to fruition. And when the investiture controversy is solved, the Pope is going to be given all control over spiritual matters. The kings and the emperor is going to have control all over all political matters. And you would think it's done and over with, but it's really not. It continues on and on and on for many, many years. All right, there are three teachers you need to know because the Middle Ages is when the idea of education starts. The first teacher that you need to know is Anselm. Anselm is going to teach that you can observe the world, and if you observe the world, then that means you can understand the Christian God better. And the idea behind this, people imagine the existence of a greater being, the world is created by something, therefore a great, greater being has to exist because the world was created, and that greater being must be the Christian God. Uh, Bernard of Clairvoy is going to teach logic. He's going to throw logic into that idea of thinking, and he's going to say, you know what? Logic leads to spirituality, and spirituality leads to heaven. Then last but not least is Peter Abelard. Abelard is going to say, you know what? You can teach logic without religion. Logic and religion can be separate. So Anselm teaches you to think there must be a higher power. Bernard says, use logic to find that higher power. And then Peter Abelard says, just use logic. You don't need religion. And it's the beliefs of Peter Abelard, this idea of logic being taught without religion, that leads to the formation of universities and education as we know it. All right, you got the Crusades. This is pretty important. Uh, there's not just one crusade. There are like seven recognized crusades. So it's not just a one-time deal. But the very first crusade is in 1095. Pope Urban II is going to call for an army to be formed to go to the Holy Land and defeat Islamic forces. Now the idea but that Urban II was thinking of is if I can control a real physical army, then I have real physical and political power. You see how that whole investiture controversy didn't actually solve anything? Here you go with Urban II still trying to have real political power in addition to his spiritual power. Now the origins of the Crusades, you can date them back to the early 1900s, uh, but I like to start with the late 900s. I said early 1900s. I meant early 900s. But if you want a specific event, let's look at the late 900s. Uh, there's a group of people called the Seljuk Turks who are going to take over the city of Jerusalem, and they're going to begin to treat Christian pilgrims poorly. Uh, Christians can still come to Jerusalem, but they're heckled, they're... Uh, they're persecuted, they're taxed unfairly, things like that, generally made to feel uncomfortable. The Byzantine emperor is supposed to be the one who protects the Christian pilgrims, but by the time we get to the late 900s, the, the Byzantine empire is not doing so well, it's starting to go broke, and he's going to ask the Catholic Church for help, and that's where Pope Urban II raises an army. Now, there's something in this for everybody. The church is going to raise an international army. The church is going to flex real political power. At the same time, the king is going to get rid of troublemakers. The Middle Ages also have cathedrals. Uh, these cathedrals were built to basically show off the wealth of towns. 
Um, and the building of cathedrals really becomes kind of a, a competition, if you will. Now, the first recognized cathedral was St. Denis in 1144. Then you got Notre Dame in 1163, and then you have a bunch of others. There's actually more stone quarried out of the ground during the, the Middle Ages than in all of ancient Egypt. Now, there were two types of cathedrals. The first one is on the right of these pictures. That's called a Romanesque. Uh, round arches, thick walls, stone roofs, small windows. The Romanesque cathedrals were really two purpose. Uh, one purpose was for church. The other purpose was for fortress and protection. The second type of cathedral is a Gothic cathedral, and that's what Notre Dame is. Um, pointed arches, large stained glass windows, these tall vaulted ceilings. And you can really see the difference between Notre Dame on the left and the Romanesque cathedral there on the right. There are not very many Romanesque cathedrals left. They were the ones that are left are mostly out in the countryside. Um, almost all of the Romanesque cathedrals that were built in towns were torn down and replaced by the Gothic cathedrals. All right, the late Middle Ages. You got to talk about the Black Death when we talk about the late Middle Ages. The Black Death is really the bubonic plague, the Black Plague. It's all the same thing. And it started in China. It slowly moved west until it gets to the Mongols. And then it's going to arrive in Europe in 1347. It's carried by fleas. It's carried by rats. And the disease began with this painful boil, this big lump on a lymph node or a lymph gland. If this boil or bump was lanced open and drained, you had a small chance to survive. And when I say small, you had a 12% chance to live if the, the bubos, if it, as it was called, was lanced open. If the boil was not lanced open, then you would bleed under your skin, you would cough up blood, and the fever would be so high you would go delirious. And from the time your symptoms showed until your death was on average two and a half days. Now the plague was extremely deadly. Um, I know we're in the middle of a pandemic right now, um, but the Black Death was much, much worse. Um, and I hate to say that because COVID-19 is no joke. Your chances of getting Black Death was 90%. Nine out of every 10 people got it. Of those nine people who got it, 70% died. So it's a huge mortality rate. Um, we used to think 25 million people died, but modern research is putting the number of deaths from the Black Plague at closer to 50 million. And it came in three different types. Bubonic Plague, which was um, blood-based. Let me start over. Bubonic plague, which was st strictly rat and flea-based. You, you had to be bitten by a flea. 50 to 70% fatal. When it became bloodborne, when you could put transmit it from person to person through, through fluids, 100% fatal. And when it became airborne, pneumonic, 100% fatal. The pneumonic plague, meaning the airborne plague, was actually 100% fatal up until the early 1900s. Now, why was the Black Death so deadly? Well, there was no resistance to it. The disease hadn't been seen in Europe for over 800 years. When it became pneumonic, it spread to the lungs, developed into pneumonia. Those people would cough, and then the, the um, Black Death particles would be spread six feet. And then it mutated, so it got more virulent. It got worse. Then you got hunger and poor nutrition, weakened people, they couldn't fight it off as well, and then there's just a lack of sanitation. People would throw their poop out on the streets, for lack of better words. Uh, even today, the plague is still fatal. I saw yesterday that the bubonic plague uh, was spotted in China. Thank you, 2020. We didn't need anything else. Um, it's still fatal today if it's not treated, but thankfully we have antibiotics today. 
even as late as World War II, the plague was still 40% fatal. So our being able to consistently defeat the Black Plague is very recent. Now, reactions to the plague varied. Um, I've got a picture here of a traditional plague doctor. You see that bird mask, and what they would do with the bird mask is at the end of the beak, they would put flowers because they thought flowers would keep the Black Death away, the nice smell. Uh, immediate reactions, church clergy died in large numbers. People would turn to the church because the church is supposed to save them. Um, good Catholics, they get last rites. They, get their, they give their final confession right at death, which is when they were very often most... Uh, the the most uh, infectious people had to look for somebody to blame so a lot of people are blamed especially Jewish people there were pogroms or uh, um, systematic killings of Jews and then there are people other people who react with parties They're like hey it's the end of the world as we know it people act react by becoming super religious and then there are some that just become hermits the longer term reaction, believe it or not, the plague was not all bad when it comes to the development of our society. In the long term reaction, the survivors get better land, there's more food available for the survivors, and wages go up because there's this demand for labor. It's also going to lead to peasant revolts in both England and France, and people are going to start getting married earlier. Now, I I know the Hundred Years' War is in the readings for this week, but I'm going to cover it next week just because this was so long. I don't want to make you sit through an hour-long lecture because I, I know none of you are going to do that. So I'm going to stop here, and we'll talk about the Hundred Years' War next week, and we'll talk about the Renaissance next week and everything else. All right, have a good weekend. We'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.